Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing part one of cellular necrosis. This is a uh, two-part series where we're going to be discussing the concepts of cellular necrosis in detail, but we're going to split it up so that it is easier for you to understand and more digestible. This is a very heavy topic, something you definitely need to understand because it's going to make up a lot of the basic foundations you need to know for the upcoming disease concepts we're going to be discussing in this lecture series. So with that being said, let's dive right in by first discussing or recapping cellular injury. Everything from the side is coming from a previous lecture, so definitely check that out. But essentially, what you need to know in the TLDR basis of uh, cellular injury is that your cells are very resilient. They are able to adapt to certain levels of stress, and they have came, they have come up with different mechanisms to handle that stress, such as hyperplasia, hypertrophy, even metaplasia. Now, our cells are able to handle a certain amount of stress. When the level of stress far exceeds our cells' ability to adapt, to that stress, cells get injured, and that's how cellular injury happens. Now, there are many different ranges of the injury, but there are two main stages you need to know, and the first one is reversible uh, injury, where you have cellular swelling happening due to blocking the sodium-potassium ATP pumps. Okay, and when you block this, you can have high intracellular sodium concentration leading to cellular swelling happening. The second step is going to be the irreversible stage where you have membrane damage, not just of the cell itself, but also of mitochondria. And when you damage the mitochondria, you are going to release cytochrome C, which is gonna induce apoptosis. And when you damage a lysosome, you are going to release enzymes, which are going to damage the cell overall. And that cellular stage, the irreversible stage, is going to lead to cell death, okay? You cannot go back from irreversible cell damage as the name says. So this is the central dogma. From a normal cell, if you put some stress on it, you can go to the reversible cell injury stage. And at this point, if you get rid of the, the, the stress, you will go back to a normal cell. But if you do not, you will progress all the way from reversible to irreversible to eventually death. Pretty straightforward. So the way things die depends on the mechanism that is causing the cells to die. Though there are two main things that you need to know. We've discussed this in our previous lecture when we were talking about cell injury in its own uh, uh, video, but cells can die through either necrosis or apoptosis. In this video, obviously, we're going to be talking about necrosis, so let's dive right in. When it comes to cellular necrosis, cellular necrosis is the death of cells occurring on a large scale, meaning this is essentially gross cell death. And when it is gross cell death, you are often able to visualize this just with your eyes if you're looking at the pathologic specimen, okay? You do not usually need a microscope to determine if there is necrosis happening. You can see it, and that's why it's happening on a large scale. And how this happens is essentially it has to do with exogenous cell injury. It's happening outside of the actual cell. So this is actually extracellular. And we're going to write that down. So this is an extracellular process. Now, because this is an extracellular process, this is something outside of the cell that's causing our cell to die, the normal intracellular enzymes that are responsible for programmed cell death, aka apoptosis, are inactivated. Our cells don't want to die. They are being killed off because of something from outside the cell. So they're not going to make the job easier by just killing themselves off. They're going to inactivate those enzymes so that they can still retain certain, some function of their normal uh, use, whatever, they, whatever their use is or whatever their role is. They want to retain some of it before they die off. Think of it as a cell holding onto dear life before dying. So Usually, this is happening because of something underlying, okay, some underlying pathologic process. And there are two key principles you need to know. In cell necrosis, you are going to have intracellular components being released, and you are going to have the presence of inflammation. The intracellular components will lead to inflammation, and the inflammation will lead to large-scale cell death. Okay. Now, there are several different types of necrosis that occur. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the first three of six called coagulative, liquefactive, and caseous necrosis. We picked these three because they're very closely related, and I'm going to talk to you about that as the lecture goes on. The other three are gangrenous, fat, and fibrinoid, which we are going to discuss in part two. So with that being said, let's dive right in and let's talk about coagulative necrosis. Coagulative necrosis occurs when the necrotic tissue remains 
firm. Now, usually this is going to happen in solid organs like the heart, the kidney, and even the liver. Now, why this happens is because when these cells are dying off, they, res they preserve their shape by coagulating the cell proteins, hence why it is called coagulative necrosis. Why would this be important? Essentially, these solid organs like your kidney, your heart, your liver are very important organs for our body and our body does not want to lose the structure even though we are losing cells because if you lose the structure, you will further lose the ability of, this, of that organ to function. Therefore, we have come up with a way to be able to still die but die, I guess, with style and those cells retain their shape even though they're dying, they're still able to help out the rest of the organ after they pass away by helping the organ continue maintaining its function. That is why majority of the solid organs will go through coagulative necrosis, especially, especially when we're dealing with why this happens. Coagulative necrosis often occurs due to an ischemic infarction, with the exception of the brain, which we're going to talk about next, so hold on there. But the ischemic infarction is going to usually lead to coagulative necrosis. An ischemic infarction means there's not enough blood going to that organ. So because you are not perfusing the organ properly, certain part of it has to die, but we don't want to lose the entire organ, and that's why we maintain the shape. I want to hammer this in so you understand it really well. So with that being said, usually... Because this is an ischemic infarction, the area of the infarction or the infarcted area is going to have a wedge shape uh, and it's going to be very pale. And I want to show you why that actually happens. Let's say this right here is our kidney. Okay, you have certain, uh, you have the renal arteries going here and then you have the renal veins, whatever, and then the renal arteries actually go and they supply the rest of the actual kidney, right? Okay, let's draw it like this. Okay, and then you have these pathways. Okay, so let's say at some point right here you get an ischemic infarction. And because you are infarcting that area, you cannot get blood going this way. Well, what is going to happen? Essentially, everything that this, uh, this area is supplying distal to the infarction is going to die off. And it's going to look something like this. Okay, so this is going to all be dead. Boom, this is all dead tissue. And that's why you get the wedge shape. But the, everything around it or everything next to it is going to have uh, collateral flow from other arteries that are going to continuously supply. Even though you were blocking part of it, the main area is not going to be uh, killed off in this area because you have collateral supply. However, this area right here where the wedge shape inf infarction is occurring is going to die because it has no collateral supply. And that's essentially why you get a wedge shape. Why is it pale? Well, because you are infarcting that area and no blood is able to get to that area. And because you have no blood, the color is going to become pale. Pretty straightforward, in my opinion. Okay, so you, when this happens, the injury is going to denature the enzymes and proteolysis is going to be blocked. And because you are blocking proteolysis, you are going to also be able to preserve the shape of the actual cell because you're going to coagulate those proteins. Proteolysis is blocked. Proteins will coagulate. Now, when you're talking about histology, you're going to see that the cellular architecture is actually preserved, which we've already talked about, but the nucleus is going to be gone. Why? Because this is already a dead cell. On a large scale, remember that, necrosis. So the other thing you're going to see is a uh, increased, excuse me, increased cytoplasmic binding of the eosin stain. And you're going to see a reddish pinkish color, which really means it's going to be eosinophilic in, uh, in I guess, uh, its looks. Uh, yeah, pretty much, pretty straightforward. But the, the the cytoplasmic binding of the eosin stain will be increased. So you can see the color differences between these two photos. Uh, but on the left side, we have a normal glomerulus. And as you can see, let's zoom in. Let's take a good look at this. So as you can see, in this glomerulus right here, the structure looks completely normal. Pretty much every cell has a nucleus, both in the glomerulus and around it, and around the tubules, every cell has a nucleus. And this just looks like a healthy kidney specimen. Okay? That's what it is really going on right here. 
Now, when we look at this slide, however, you can see this is a lot different than our previous slide. Now, the architecture looks good. This does look like a kidney, right? This does look like a glomerulus. So that means that the architecture is preserved, which is pretty important because this is one hallmark distinguishing factor of coagulative necrosis. But when you look deeper, you see there are a lot less uh, number of nuclei in the cells. So there are very low nuclei, okay? And the cells are lacking nuclei. So this whole area, there are no nuclei. There's one right here, there's one right here, but you see this entire glomerulus has barely any surviving or living cells, even though the architecture is uh, normal. And that is because this is a necrotic sample okay and what kind of necrosis is it going uh, is it undergoing it is coagulative necrosis most likely because of ischemia okay so that is coagulative necrosis so let's move on to liquefactive necrosis liquefactive necrosis is seen when you have necrotic tissue that is still soft now usually this is going to occur in soft organs like the brain and the reason why this is happening is because you're going to have enzymatic lysis of the cells and the surrounding proteins when you have this you are going to denature proteins okay and structures that allow for stability and when this happens you are going to see loose okay and I would say soft tissue that should not really be there and I'll show you what it looks like in a second but there are three main instances that this is going to happen number one is going to be a brain infarction or a massive stroke or a complete uh, uh, infarction to a portion of the brain number two is going to be an abscess and this occurs because when you have an abscess you have a walled off area of uh, an infection and the neutrophils are going to release enzymes to kill off whatever is in that walled off area as a form of protection when they release those enzymes they are going to denature and liquefy that area so you are going to see uh, liquefactive necrosis happening within an abscess that's why the only way to get through is actually puncture through the abscess, drain it, clean it out, and then give antibiotics. But an abscess is actually uh, leading to liquefactive necrosis within that walled off area. And then finally, you have pancreatitis because in pancreatitis, when you are blocking the pancreatic duct, you are preventing pancreatic uh, uh, juices from leaving. Within those juices, you have pancreatic enzymes. And when you prevent that, the pancreatic enzymes auto digest the pancreas. And that's why you have to treat pancreatitis kind of strongly, kind of uh, uh, rapidly to prevent necro uh, the pancreas from becoming necrotic and undergoing liquefactive necrosis. This is mainly an enzyme-mediated condition. Okay, so when you think about liquefactive necrosis, think about enzymes. When you're thinking about uh, coagulative, the previous one, think about an infarction. Now, when you're talking about histology, you're going to see a lot of cellular debris. You're going to see macrophages. If you're looking in the brain, you might see a cystic space or a cavitation. And when you're talking about bacterial infections, you might also see neutrophils as well as cellular debris. So let's take a look at what it looks like on uh, a gross level. This is a, a brain uh, slide. And as you can see, the left side of the photo is very, very different than the right side. The right side, the white matter is normal. The dark matter is also normal. You can see this clear delineation between the two. But on the left side, you see that's completely lost. In fact, from this point onward, the whole area is starting to become necrotic. You even have a cystic space right here. Okay, so cystic lesion right here. And then the rest of this tissue looks very wet, it looks very denatured, and it just looks, for lack of a better word, liquefactive. It's pretty self-explanatory when you see this photo, so I hope this is clear for your uh, educational purposes. Now that's liquefactive necrosis. Finally, we have caseous necrosis, and there's a reason why we put this at the very end, because caseous necrosis resembles the other two types of necrosis. Caseous necrosis occurs when you have necrotic tissue that has a cottage cheese-like appearance, and you will never forget this. You will never forget this after I show you the gross image, okay? So stay tuned. But 
Usually this is going to occur in solid organs, just like the heart, uh, the kidneys and liver, similar to coagulative necrosis, right? And that's very important because it is a combination of both coagulative and liquefactive necrosis, hence why we put it at the end. We wanted you to get a good understanding of coagulative and liquefactive necrosis before we actually talk about caseous necrosis. Now, usually this is going to occur due to an infection, and there are very certain infections, very certain uh, bacteria and fungi that you need to know about that lead to caseous necrosis. In fact, they are hallmark infections that have caseous necrosis. So if you see this, you should know what uh, organism we're thinking about or you should be thinking about during your exams. Now, usually this can be caused by TB, systemic fungi like histoplasma can lead to this, even nocardia can cause caseous necrosis in the lungs, so keep that in mind. In this condition, you're gonna have macrophages that are gonna wall off that infecting the uh, microorganism, so they're gonna have a kind of uh, structure around that or the, the infection, and when they do that, they're going to lead to granular debris forming. That's because the macrophages are trying to kill off whatever infection is going on, and that killing process leads to the debris that you see in the caseous necrosis that we classify as cottage cheese. Now, the histologic uh, characterization or the, the thing you're going to see on histology is going to be a granuloma, which are just fragmented cells with debris that's surrounded uh, by lymphocytes and macrophages. Okay, So this is what caseous necrosis looks like right here. Told you you will never forget this. Cottage cheese. Okay, this is liquefact. This is liquefactive and coagulative necrosis occurring essentially at the same time. And that's why you get caseous necrosis. So these are the first three types of necrosis that we're going to be discussing. In part two, we will be discussing the last three, which are gangrenous, fat, and fibrinoid. If this was helpful for you, consider subscribing to our channel because with your support, we're able to keep this content for free. And if you want to see more content like this, go to our website at uh, www.madmedicine.org where you'll find more additional resources as well as uh, educational videos for your learning purposes. Thank you.